Good morning. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to welcome all of you here today for this groundbreaking ceremony of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. This, this is a milestone. This is a milestone moment, not only for the Smithsonian, but for the United States. Today, we take the first step in creating an iconic building that will house something truly wonderful, a museum with the power to change hearts and minds, and ultimately, the nation. And your being here today speaks to your support of this one spectacular effort. Creating this museum has captured the attention of government, private citizens, and it has also drawn on the commitment of corporate America, community groups, and school groups. And today we salute this undertaking with extraordinary music and inspiring speakers, all in celebration of this moment and the American spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Michelle Obama. Please remain standing. Please remain standing for the presentation of, of the colors by the Smithsonian Institution Office of Protection Services Honor Guard and the national anthem performed by Ms. Denise Graves.
please join me in welcoming from the Abyssinian Church in Harlem, the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, the Reverend Calvin Butts III. I'm delighted to have been given this opportunity to say a word of inspiration concerning the National Museum of African American History and Culture. African American. What is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea? Jungle star, jungle track, strong bronze men or regal black? Women from whose loins I sprang when the birds of Eden sang one three centuries removed from the land his father loved. Spicy grove and cinnamon tree, what is Africa to me? Yet, beloved, I too sing America. I'm the darker brother. When company would come, they would send me to the kitchen. But that's all right, I'd laugh, go to the kitchen. I'd eat and grow fat. Tomorrow, I'd be at the table. Company would come and they would see how beautiful I am, and no one would ever send me to the kitchen again. Yes, beloved, I too sing America, my country, tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. This may be the land of the pilgrim's pride, but it's also the land where my mothers and fathers died. So let freedom ring. Ring. Yes, let freedom ring. Ring for the Ashanti. Ring for the Aruba, ring for the crew, arriving on a nightmare, yet praying for a dream. Dream a world, beloved, where man no other man will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. Dream a world, beloved, where all will walk sweet freedom's way, and greed not sap our souls or avarice bright our day. Dream a world where black or white, whatever race you be, will enjoy the bounty of the earth and everyone be free. Where wretchedness will hang its ugly head and joy like a pearl adorn the earth. Of such I dream our world. I have a dream today that everyone would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Everyone, the poor white fooled and pushed apart. Everyone, the Negro bearing slavery scar. Everyone, the red man pushed from the land. Everyone, the immigrant clutching the hope that she seeks, but finding the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog and mighty crush the weak. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America for me, but yet I swear this oath, America will be. And America is becoming because so many brave women and men have fought to preserve the integrity of the land of the free and the home of the brave. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, Crispus Attucks. 200,000 sons of Ethiopia who gave their lives in order to hold the union together. Heroes proved in liberating strife who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life. Dory Miller, the 369th Harlem Hellfighters, and of course the Tuskegee Airmen who more than themselves their country loved and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine till all success, Barack Obama in the White House, till all success, Martin Luther King Jr. on the National Mall, to all success, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. Shalom, salam alaikum. Peace be unto you. God bless America. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Stanley Thurston and the Heritage Signature Chorale.
music from the church has touched hearts and, stole, and stirred souls for generations. It has soothed in times of trouble and inspired the weary to do great and noble things. Today, the Heritage Signature Chorale will perform a landmark liturgical work, My Soul is Anchored in the Lord. Soul stirring indeed. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Creating the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture is a grand endeavor, and a grand endeavor necessitates visionary leadership with courage and a willingness to dream big. Well, such a leader has been guiding the development of this museum for six years. His efforts have brought us this moment, and his guidance will take us to the day when the National Museum of African American History and Culture opens its doors on this spot. Please welcome the founding director of this museum, Lonnie Bunch. What a grand and glorious day, and they said it was going to snow. 
President and Mrs. Obama, members of Congress, the Smithsonian Regents, the Presidential Commission, the Museum's Council, distinguished, distinguished guests, and dear friends. I am honored and humbled to welcome you to this groundbreaking ceremony for the newest museum of the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I just love to say that. Your presence today is a clear reminder of the unflagging support and leadership that you have provided this endeavor. We are at this moment. We have come this far, not by faith alone, but because of your belief in the importance of this museum. While there are too many donors and supporters to name, I want you to know just how much the Smithsonian appreciates the support of President and Mrs. Obama of the US Congress and of all the corporations, foundations, and individuals in communities across America who have given so much to make this moment possible. I especially want to acknowledge the Council of the Museum that is co-chaired by Linda Johnson Rice and Dick Parsons. We are so indebted to you because you believed when there wasn't much to believe in. So we are so grateful for your leadership. Today, in the words of Washington, D.C. poet Louis Alexander, we call the lost dream back. Today, we begin to make manifest on this mall, on this sacred space, the dreams of many generations who fought for and believe that there should be a site in the nation's capital that will help all Americans remember and honor African American history and culture. But equally important to this vision was to need to make better all who visit the National Museum by using African American culture as a lens to more clearly understand what it means to be an American. So with groundbreaking, we mark a major milestone in the creation of this museum, a museum that, as the beloved historian John O. Franklin used to always say to me, it must tell the unvarnished truth. Because this will be a museum that will have moments to make one cry or to ponder the pain of slavery and segregation. But it will also be a signature green museum designed by the gifted architectural team of Freeland Ajay Bon and the Smith Group, but a museum that soars on the resiliency of a people and will illuminate the joy and the belief in the promise of America that has shaped this community. This building will remind us that there are few things as powerful as a people, as a nation steeped in its history, and there is nothing nobler than honoring all of our ancestors by remembering the full, rich, and diverse history of America. And as with any endeavor of this sort, it has not been without challenges and difficult moments. But what buoys all who work on this project has been the support that comes from unexpected quarters, such as the man who shines shoes in a Texas airport, who said to me, while he's unsure exactly what would be in a museum, he hoped that this museum would be, in his words, it may be the only place where his grandchildren learn what life did to him and what he did to life. Or the woman who cleans one of the Smithsonian museums, who reminded me the other day that she is tired and able to retire. But she said to me, I want to continue to work so that I can clean our museum. So I would be remiss if I didn't thank the entire Smithsonian family for helping this museum make a way out of no way. The leadership of Secretary Clough and Richard Curran and, and the Regents, and I want to especially nod to my dear friend Patty Stonecipher for all her support. And I want, thank you Patty. And I especially want to acknowledge the gifted staff of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Yeah. 
While I may stand in front of you, they do the work to make all things possible. During the Great Depression, historians were hired by the federal government to interview formerly enslaved African Americans. When 82-year-old Cornelius Holmes was asked if the experience of the enslaved still mattered, he answered, though the slavery question is settled, the race question will be with us always. It is in our politics, it is in our courts, it is on our highways, it is in our manners, it is in our religion and in our thoughts all the day, every day. Well, what a gift you have all given by helping to birth this museum so that everyone who visits will realize that we are all touched, shaped, and enriched by African American history and culture all the day, every day. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome the mayor of the District of Columbia, Vincent Gray. Good morning. Not to worry, we have decreed there will be no more snow in the District of Columbia ever. <laughs> As mayor of the nation's capital, it is my honor uh, to greet you and on this auspicious occasion uh, here in our great city. Uh, you've gathered here today to break ground on a site that will provide the foundation for much more than simply another new building in Washington, D.C. Today's groundbreaking is a milestone that fulfills the dreams and aspirations of many generations and honors all of those on whose shoulders we stand at this point. This will be a museum for all Americans. It will celebrate every American story not just black history. The fact that the museum will be completed in 2015 is indeed significant, because that year we also will celebrate the anniversaries of two significant events in our nation's history. 2015 will mark both the 150th anniversary of the constitutional abolition of slavery and the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The 13th Amendment fundamentally changed our Constitution and our nation, and the Voting Rights Act allowed America to fulfill its promise. One of the great African-American leaders who helped guide our nation to live up to its own creed now has a monument dedicated to him not far from here. Just last month, we celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birth. And a few months ago, we dedicated his memorial, another national monument that was a long time coming. His dream was that we could all come together to make our nation and our world a better place. His message was not, was not for one racial group, but for all people of all backgrounds, ethnicities, and creeds. This museum will be a tangible manifestation of Dr. King's dream. As the mayor of a city that itself is central to the story of freedom for all Americans, I eagerly anticipate the completion of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I'm proud that the District of Columbia will be its home. Thank you very much. And I look forward, as all of you do, to 2015, when we will reconvene here for the official, official opening of our new museum. Thank you very much. We all know that the Smithsonian Institution is a place of learning. It's a place where history, art, and culture come alive in a vibrant way. And helping to make sure that this happens is Dr. Richard Curran. For many years, he was the force behind the annual Folk Life Festival, which draws more than a million people to the National Mall for two glorious months, two glorious weeks, rather, in the month of June. And now, as undersecretary for the Smithsonian, he helps guide the work of the history and culture museums, including the one for which we are breaking ground today. It gives me great pleasure to present 
the Smithsonian's Undersecretary for History, Art, and Culture, Dr. Richard Curran. Good morning. All that Undersecretary stuff, I am Lonnie Bunch's downfield block. <laughs> Only once in a generation have citizens and the leadership uh, of this country gathered to sink a shovel into the ground of this national mall to establish a museum, a library, an archive, or gallery. But let us for a moment reflect on the history that leads us here today. Exactly 150 years ago, in February 1862, with the Civil War raging, the Smithsonian hosted a series of abolitionist lectures. President Abraham Lincoln, leading officials, and large audiences attended. Newspaper coverage assured that the nation knew about these lectures. Their aim was to convince the president to end slavery. Week after week at the Smithsonian, Horace Greeley, Wendell Phillips, Ralph Waldo Emerson, others spoke. Frederick Douglass, the great American orator, was scheduled to give the culminating lecture. But such were the times in America, such were the divisions, that Joseph Henry, the secretary of the Smithsonian, and science advisor to the president said, I will not allow a black man to speak in the rooms of the Smithsonian. Frederick Douglass was denied his place in the National Museum. The irony was that Secretary Henry's most reliable staff member was a man named Solomon Brown, an African-American poet, self-educated scientist. He built the exhibits at the Smithsonian. He made the maps. He served the Smithsonian for 54 years. And many others, some in this room, followed Brown guarding treasures, cleaning the museums, carrying out the research, developing programs, and helping to lead the institution. The historical record, though, is checkered. Notably, in 1891, the Smithsonian's National Zoo opened its grounds to African Americans on Easter Monday, given that the community was not allowed to participate in the celebrations on the White House lawn. Well into the 20th century, Curators purposefully excluded African-American history. In 1947, the descendants of Christian Fleetwood tried to integrate the Smithsonian's collections by donating the Medal of Honor this black soldier had won for heroism in the Civil War. They were rebuffed until the secretary of the Smithsonian at that time intervened. And with the Poor People's March on Washington in 1968, Many advised closing the Smithsonian museums to keep the people out. Secretary Ripley did the opposite, keeping them open extra hours in order to let everyone in. Now, we've come a long, long way since Joseph Henry uttered those words. And we can't change what he said, but we can correct it. With this building, we can today proudly say Frederick Douglass's words will certainly be heard in the rooms of the Smithsonian. So too will those voices of millions of others. Simply, this museum makes for a more inclusive Smithsonian, a more inclusive America. And that is good for this country, and it's good for the world. The co-chairs of the Museum's Advisory Council, Linda Johnson Rice and Richard Parsons, have played key leadership roles in ensuring that we hear the many compelling voices of our nation's history. Linda is the chair of Johnson Publishing Company, publisher of Jet and Ebony magazines. Dick is the chair of Citigroup. Please give a warm welcome to Linda Johnson Rice and Dick Parsons. On behalf of uh, the Advisory Council of this, the Smithsonian's 19th Museum, 
the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Linda and I would like to extend our sincere appreciation for your sharing this incredible moment with us. Uh, we would especially like to thank all of our founding donors, and it's an honor to celebrate this important museum with President and Mrs. Obama, a distinct, unique, great honor, <laughs> fabulous honor. While you are all dignitaries, I'd like to just make mention of the fact that Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, the district representative, Congressman Clyburn are here, as well as so many of our great supporters and other distinguished guests. All of you have helped achieve this significant milestone. Thank you for taking this journey with us. And one of the things I'd like to do, because nobody gets anything done by themselves or even with an able and beautiful partner, we have a council, you've heard it referred to before, that has been with us on this journey and with Lonnie all supporting and advising. I'd like the members of the advisory council to stand and receive your applause and appreciation. And if I can be allowed just one moment of personal reflection before I turn it over to Linda, uh, the significance of this day to me. You know, it's, it's often said, and I've read it many times, that history is written by the winners. History is written by the winners. And to me, the reality of this museum puts an exclamation mark at the end of the sentence that after 400 years of struggle, of triumph, of tragedy, of turmoil, of turbulence, we won. Well said, Rick. Well said. As members of this council, we have had the pleasure of witnessing a vision take shape, one that, as Lonnie Bunch has indicated, will encourage us to remember, reflect, and rejoice, one that will help us better understand the hope, the optimism, the struggles, the determination, and triumphs of the American story. Today, we will break ground for a museum that has been a long time in the making, and I'm delighted to introduce one of the champions that made it a reality. Congressman John Lewis is a symbol. The last surviving speaker from the 1963 March on Washington and a hero of the Civil Rights era. In February 2011, John Lewis received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. He sponsored the legislation in the House of Representatives to establish this museum. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable John Lewis. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Linda, for those kind words of introduction. Mr. President, Mrs. Obama, Mrs. Bush, my colleagues from the Congress, my beloved friends, what we witness today will go down in history. It is the substance of things hoped for and the validation of our dreams. It is the moment of people protested, struggled, and longed for. It is the moment millions of our ancestors believe in, but died never to behold. It is that point of critical mass when an idea becomes so powerful, it leaves the rims of inspiration and becomes visible, even to the untrained eye. This is an idea whose time has come. 
When I think about all it took to reach this point, the black Civil War veterans who took up the cause many decades ago, the spirit debate and the long years of silence, the language of advocates and their opponents, when I think about the plane crash that killed one champion and the election of this poor boy from rural Alabama, who spent more than half of his congressional career introducing the mu museum bill, only to have it end in a bipartisan effort, inspired by men and women of faith. It reminds me of the words of one of my favorite poets, Langston Hughes which seems so fitting and appropriate here. The name of the poem is Harlem. And in it, he says, what happened to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, a festival like a sore, and then run? Maybe it just sag like a heavy load, or does it explode? Today, we must thank the White House and the United States Congress, my former colleague, Governor Sam Brownback, Senator Max Cleland, and Congressman J.C. Watts, the Smithsonian Board of Regents, the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Wayne Clough, the Director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Lonnie Bunch, and his entire staff. The Distinguished Advisor Council of Celebrity and Scholars and the general corporate and individual donors who have taken a dream deferred and helped it find its place in history. This is an end, but it is also a beginning. There's still much work to do, and as we pursue this worthy goal, sent us down through the ages, we must not shrink. We must call upon the courage of those who were in the struggle long before any of us were born. We must tell the story, the whole story, 400 years story of African-American contribution to this nation's history from slavery to the present without anger or apology. The problem we face today as a nation, make it plain Make it clear that there's still a great deal of pain that needs to be healed. The story told in this building can speak the truth that has the power to set an entire nation free and reveal the boldest lesson of liberty, justice, and the true democracy to us all. I look forward, Lenny Bunch, I look forward to the day when I can ample through the exhibits, search through the archives, participate in the program, rest my tired feet in the cafe, and get lost in history inside the granite wall of an idea whose time has finally come. We didn't give up. We didn't give in. We didn't give out. We didn't get lost in a sea of despair. We kept a faith. We kept our eyes on the prize. Thank you. Congressman Lewis, inspiring. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you another renowned and important supporter of the new museum. Governor Sam Brownback served 14 years in the United States Senate prior to becoming the governor of the state of Kansas in 2011. His commitment to this museum is based on his deep commitment to human rights. While in the Senate, he called on the United States to condemn the genocide in Sudan's Darfur region and he consistently introduced legislation to ban human trafficking around the world. Governor Brownback sponsored the legislation in the Senate to establish this museum. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Governor Sam Brownback.
great honor to be here with you, Mr. President, Ms. Obama, my uh, former colleague, John Lewis, other colleagues that are here. This is a momentous occasion, and I'm delighted to be a part of it. In Kansas, we have a deep sense, really, of our state's history and destiny. We're one of the few states in the Union that was formed for a cause, and our cause was to end the barbaric practice of slavery. John Brown was one of our most famous residents. The president was also a resident of Kansas at one time. John Brown's legacy is a mix of righteousness, violence, and zealotry. But his cause was the undoing of the enormous crime of slavery. Before he was executed for treason, he spoke these haunting and prescient words. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but by blood. A great deal of blood was shed in the years that followed, even after the Civil War. The nation had a long way to go before we could realize the goals laid forth in our founding documents. Blatant bigotry, casual disrespect, and an ever-present disregard for the dignity of African Americans was the rule and not the exception in our land. This even after legal segregation was ended, even after Dr. King marched on Washington, even after Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, even after those three shots rang out in Memphis and another American poet and prophet was called home to be with the Lord. The African-American people have experienced the worst of our shortcomings as a nation. The shortcomings of justice, of compassion, of humanity. This museum will allow the culture and the identity of the African-American people to be celebrated as one that shed these unconscionable circumstances, met its unparalleled challenges, and rose to an unimaginable achievement. The groundbreaking of this museum could not be more timely. Now, some could cynically see it as an attempt to gloss over the sins of the past or as an attempt to pay back the injustices. It is neither of those things. It is instead a celebration of a uniquely American triumph of will. To consider this museum an airing of grievances is to, is to sell it dramatically short. It is, in fact, a presentation of the triumph of the African-American people. This museum cannot be for Caucasian grandchildren just to see how awful the crimes of their ancestors were, or for the African-American grandchildren to see how terrible their ancestors were treated. This museum is for the American grandchildren to see the triumph of great Americans. In 1957, Dr. King wrote these words, but the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. We are one step closer to that vision today. God bless you all, and thank you for being here. Learning American history through listening to music could be considered by some a shortcut. That is unless, of course, the teacher is the opera star, Thomas Hampson. Then it's more than just learning, it's being transported. This celebrated baritone from Washington State is revered for his interpretation of Mahler and Verdi. But he has long been an advocate of American song. Today, he graces this celebration with works by two iconic American composers, Grief by William Grant Still and Simple Gifts by Aaron Copeland. Pin. 
minions trailing and head bowed low in your hands. Morning angel with heartstrings wailing for one who in death's hall stands. Morning angel, silence your wailing and raise your head from your hands. Weeping angel on your pinions trailing, the white dawn Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true Simplicity is gained to bow and to bend. We shan't be ashamed to turn. Turn will be our delight till by turning, turning we come round right. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift. To come down where you ought to be, and when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and Ladies and gentlemen, returning to you now, founding museum director, Lonnie Bunch. You know, as I mentioned earlier, this museum is indebted to a wonderful array of donors and supporters. But today, I want to acknowledge our youngest donors. One of my former students, Tracy Minna, worked with children at the Stuyvesant Montessori School as they celebrated the history of African Americans. When they learned of the museum, they started an effort entitled, Make a Change with Change. So last year, these students collected $600 in coins and presented it to the museum. Today, today, today they, oh, they're cute. Oh. 
Hi, how are you? Today they are here with their second gift. Please welcome Tracy Mina, Marisa Grant, Ajane, and, and Piper. Thank you. As we said in my North Jersey neighborhood, cash makes no enemies, let's be friends. <laughs> I'm so moved by that, and I want to thank them so much. And again, join me in thanking the Cybers and Montessori School. Yes, living proof, generosity comes in all sizes. No list of American composers is complete without the name Edward Kennedy Ellington, Duke Ellington, that is. Ellington called his music American music, not jazz, uh, rather than jazz. Um, he gave America memorable music for more than 50 years as a composer, as, as a band leader, and as a pianist. And there's one contemporary pianist who keeps the Ellington legacy alive, and his name is Jason Moran. Now, of course, Jason is about creating his own 40-carat history. Last summer, he walked away with three major awards from Downbeat's annual critics poll, Best Pianist, Jazz Album of the Year, and Artist of the Year. Today, he is performing the Ellington Classic I like the sunshine. Please welcome Jason Moran.
That was Jason Moran, and the Smithsonian Magazine recently dubbed him Keeper of the Keys. And after that rendition of Ellington's I Like the Sunrise, I think we all know why. Yes. Thank you, Jason Moran. Every day, millions experience the wonder of the Smithsonian. Children engage with timeless artwork in all of its museums. Teachers spark the fascination of teenagers with science lessons shaped by the Smithsonian scholars. Researchers navigate the vastness of the ocean and explore the biodiversity of Panama. Guiding the work of the largest museum and research complex in the world is Dr. Wayne Clough. As the 12th Secretary of the Smithsonian, Wayne Clough is overseeing a $900 million building and renovation program, which includes the construction of the Smithsonian's 19th Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, for which we are breaking ground today. With a doctorate, in civil engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. Clough was president of the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta for 14 years. As head of the Smithsonian since 2008, he has put the Smithsonian's attention in what he calls four grand challenges. Unlocking the mysteries of the universe, understanding and sustaining a biodiverse planet, valuing world cultures and understanding the American experience. It is with honor that I present to you Dr. Wayne Clough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Rashad, for that very kind introduction. Wow, what a beautiful day. It's an honor to be here as the 12th Secretary of the Smithsonian with President Obama, Mrs. Obama, Mr. Bush, all these distinguished guests and wonderful friends who are here. It is a remarkable day. At the Smithsonian, of course, we strive to provide a lens through which America can see the world and indeed the world can see America. And today that picture comes sharply into focus. The National Museum of African American History and Culture adds essential chapters to the essential American story. Voices silenced in the past will be heard here, now, and in the future. We realize this dream, a lifelong dream, thanks to the generosity of the administration, the Congress, and the American people. Working together, we bring America's treasures to parents, teachers, learners of all ages, across the country, around the world, and best of all, it's all free. No inflation here. When museum director Lonnie Bunch started, he had a staff of exactly two and zero objects. No concrete, of course, has yet been poured for this museum, but Lonnie and his team have already created a strong foundation for it because today he has more than 20,000 artifacts in addition to education programs and online presence and vibrant exhibitions. In 2015, visitors will be witness to history when this new building opens its doors to America and the world. It will join our 18 other Smithsonian museums which tell the stories of all the people who made this country great. Our existing museums and this secretary will support Lonnie and this museum, allowing us to fully speak to African Americans' contributions in art, history, culture, and science. So many thanks to Lonnie and his colleagues, the Museum's Advisory Council, all of our regents, and especially Patty Stone Cipher for her work throughout this, and for helping bring all this, this project to fruition. Of course, we are honored to welcome President and Mrs. Obama. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for encouraging and supporting this and many other Smithsonian initiatives. 
We are here today, of course, thanks to the leadership of many. President and Ms. Bush were essential. Members of the House and the Senate and a host of local officials made it happen. This was a true bipartisan effort, echoing this museum's message of unity. What a magnificent location imbued with powerful symbolism. It's a fitting home for this museum invoking the indelible threads that connect the fabric of African-American stories to the American tapestry. Even as we break ground on the National Mall, I want to ensure the entire country who are watching on webcast that we reach far beyond the nation's capital. If you can't come to us, we come to you via new technology and through our 170 affiliate museums located around the country and our traveling exhibitions. So to the teachers and students who are watching, imagine your schools in a few years and what you might receive in terms of information from this museum. Maybe a hologram of Martin Luther King might walk right off the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and into your classroom. But we don't have to wait for the future. Thanks to technology, the leaders of tomorrow have the world in the palms of their hand today. And that's where you'll find the Smithsonian telling these important and compelling stories. So to this day, we add to America's chorus of voices, voices that inspire us to recall the past and illuminate the present and ensure a better future for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. So please welcome a valued friend of the Smithsonian and one of the museum's dedicated council members, Ms. Laura Bush. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne, for that introduction. And good morning to everyone. Good morning, President and Mrs. Obama, Director Lonnie Bunch, and all our distinguished guests and all Americans who've joined us for this very important occasion. It's especially fitting that we're dedicating this plot of land on our National Mall for a museum that remembers, reveres, and celebrates the great struggles and even greater contributions that African Americans have made to our nation's history. Just down the road from here, both the White House and the Capitol were built in part by the labor of African American slaves. We don't know most of their names, but they left a lasting legacy in the bricks and stone and beautiful craftsmanship that now house our democracy's most vital institutions. Here too in this city is where a young congressman named Abraham Lincoln was horrified by the sight of slave pens standing near the grounds of the Capitol and where later President Lincoln would sign the Transforming Emancipation Proclamation. Here in this city is where the great abolitionist, Frederick Douglass, came to offer counsel to Lincoln and was welcomed by the president into the White House. Here on this very mall is where the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. stood and shared his dream of the nation where we're all measured by the content of our character and where we join together at one table, the table of brotherhood. And here in this city is also where President Lyndon Johnson fought for and signed the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964. Today, African Americans help lead our nation in all facets of life, from government, to the military, to the law, from business to the arts, to medicine and education. This museum will share these stories and will pay tribute to the many lives, known and unknown, that have so immeasurably enriched our nation. The National Museum of African American History and Culture began as a bipartisan effort through legislation sponsored by Representatives John Lewis and J.C. Watts, and Senators Sam Brownback and Max Cleland. My husband, 
President Bush was proud to sign it into law in 2003 and to envision the museum to be built on the mall where we honor artists, inventors, explorers, soldiers, and statesmen. I'm particularly proud that the, of the museum's vision, which is dedicated not simply to this building, but also to reaching out to communities around the nation. The museum has already begun traveling expeditions and artifact preservation programs. It's a museum de dedicated to welcoming all Americans, whether or not they'll be able to travel to Washington, D.C. I'm glad, too, that this building will stand next to the monument to our first president, George Washington, a man who fought for liberty and who came to recognize the evils of bondage, freeing his slaves in his will. Side by side, these two spots are symbolic of our own national journey. For the stories that will be preserved within these walls, the stories of suffering and perseverance, of daring, of imagination, and of triumph are the stories of African Americans. But they're also stories that are forever woven through the heart of the fabric of our nation. Thank you all, and God bless you all. Now it's my honor to introduce a friend, a scholar, an accomplished astrophysicist, two times university president and now president of Purdue University, and most importantly, new chair of the Smithsonian Board of Regents and my boss, Franz Cordova. <laughs> Mr. President, Mrs. Obama, fellow regents and honored guests, good morning. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I'd like to welcome all of you here to this incredible ceremony. I'd like to also congratulate the Council of the National Museum of American History and Culture, the museum's dedicated staff, and its founding director, Lonnie Bunch, on achieving this historic milestone. That we are breaking ground for the construction of the museum's permanent home is a testament to their shared vision and hard work. In 2003, the regents were honored when the Congress passed and President Bush signed legislation establishing the National Museum of African American History and Culture within the Smithsonian. Since that time, the regents have made opening the museum our number one priority. The legislation also tasked the regents with one duty particularly relevant to our gathering today. We were asked to select the site for the new museum. Over the course of two years, we listened to a passionate discourse on the museum through public town halls and on the internet. We consulted closely with the museum's council and other Smithsonian stakeholders. We considered a number of attractive alternatives, but in the end, our decision was easy. We recognized that the story of African American culture and history is central to the story of America. It is a story that we believe can be best told from America's front yard, the National Mall, here at the foot of the Washington Monument next to the Museum of American History in view of the Capitol and within blocks of the White House. Sometimes location is indeed everything. <laughs> and this site underscores the Smithsonian's and the nation's commitment to telling the whole American story. As a scientist and educator, I was taken with some recent photographs of President Obama hosting students at a science fair in the White House. 
By opening the White House doors to outstanding young student scientists, the President sent an important and inspiring message to young Americans that science and learning are critical to the future of this nation and a top priority for us all. Since 1846, the Smithsonian has been opening its doors to student scientists, historians, artists, or those just seeking to learn more about themselves, the nation, and the world. We're grateful to the President and Mrs. Obama for their inspiring support of education, the Smithsonian, and this wonderful and important new museum. It is now my great honor and privilege to welcome the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, please have a seat. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to thank uh, France for that introduction and for her leadership uh, at the Smithsonian. Uh, I want to thank everybody who helped to make this day happen. Uh, I want to thank Laura Bush, uh, Secretary Salazar, uh, Sam Brownback, uh, my hero, Congressman John Lewis, uh, Wayne Clough, and everybody who's worked so hard to make this possible. I am so proud of Lonnie Bunch, who came here from Chicago, I want to point out. Uh, I remember having a conversation with him about this job uh, when he was planning to, to embark on this extraordinary journey. And uh, we could not be prouder uh, of the work that he has done to help uh, make this day possible. Uh, I promise to do my part by being brief. As others have mentioned, this day has been a long time coming. The idea for a museum dedicated to African Americans was first put forward by black veterans of the Civil War. And years later, the call was picked up by members of the civil rights generation, by men and women who knew how to fight for what was right and strive for what is just. This is their day. This is your day. It's an honor to be here to see the fruit of your labor. It's also fitting that this museum has found a home on the National Mall. As has been mentioned, it was on this ground long ago that lives were once traded, where hundreds of thousands once marched for jobs and for freedom. It was here that the pillars of our democracy were built often by black hands. And it is on this spot, alongside the monuments to those who gave birth to this nation and those who worked so hard to perfect it, that generations will remember the sometimes difficult, often inspirational, but always central role that African Americans have played in the life of our country. This museum will celebrate that history. Because just as the memories of our earliest days have been confined to dusty letters and faded pictures, the time will come when few people remember drinking from a colored water fountain, or boarding a segregated bus, or hearing in person Dr. King's voice boom down from the Lincoln Memorial. And that's why what we build here won't just be an achievement for our time, it will be a monument for all time. It will do more than simply keep those memories alive. Just like the Air and Space Museum challenges us to set our sights higher, or the Natural History Museum encourages us to look closer, or the Holocaust Museum calls us to fight persecution wherever we find it, this museum should inspire us as well. It should stand as proof that the most important things in life rarely come quickly or easily. 
It should remind us that although we have yet to reach the mountaintop, we cannot stop climbing. And that's why, in moments like this, uh, I think about Malia and Sasha. I think about my daughters, and I think about your children, the millions of visitors who will stand where we stand long after we're gone. And I think about what I want them to experience. I think about what I want them to take away. When our children look at Harriet Tubman's shawl or, or Nat Turner's Bible or the plane flown by a Tuskegee Airmen, I don't want them to be seen as figures somehow larger than life. I want them to see how ordinary Americans could do extraordinary things, how men and women just like them had the courage and determination to right a wrong, to make it right. I want my daughters to see the shackles that bound slaves on their voyage across the ocean and the shards of glass that flew from the 16th Street Baptist Church and understand that injustice and evil exists in the world. But I also want them to hear Louis Armstrong's horn and learn about the Negro League and read the poems of Phyllis Whitley. And I want them to appreciate this museum not just as a record of tragedy, but as a celebration of life. And when future generations hear these songs of pain and progress and struggle and sacrifice, I hope they will not think of them as somehow separate from the larger American story. I want them to see it as central and important part of our shared story, a call to see ourselves in one another, a call to remember that each of us is made in God's image. That's the history we will preserve within these walls, the history of a people who, in the words of Dr. King, injected new meaning and dignity into the veins of civilization. May we remember their stories. May we live up to their example. Thank you. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. At this time, I'd like to invite the groundbreakers to gather at the foot of the steps at the stage here. Okay, once you're ready with your instruments, <laughs> I would like to invite everyone to join me in the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, break ground.
bring in the finale of the program for today, which is the, the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which will be led by our combined choirs from St. Alban School, from Afro Blue, and from the Heritage Signature Chorale, accompanied by the U.S. Navy Band. And we also have our guest soloist, Denise Graves, and Mr. Thomas Hampson to come in to join us. So might we all stand for the Negro National Anthem? And let's welcome to the stage Ms. Denise Graves and Thomas Hampson. Thank you. 